Okay, folks, here we are. Probably the most requested topic of all, the composite position tolerance. And this is advanced class stuff, man. If you have not done the pegs and holes lesson one, two, three, stuff on datums, you really ought to cover that stuff. If, if you've already got your feet wet in GD&T and you just want to uh, brush up on composite, okay. But uh, venture forward at your own risk. Don't, don't hesitate. If something doesn't quite make sense, go back to some of those other videos. Maybe check out that study guide that I put on there. Uh, also, if you are watching these videos, man, go into the, the three little dots or the little gear icon and speed me up. Watch me at 1.5, uh, 1 and 3 quarter, maybe, maybe 2x and go until something doesn't make sense and you oh, slow it back down rewind and and watch that part this stuff is this is dry stuff man i try to make it exciting but if you can speed up the youtube player that you're using man it, it really really helps you can get through a lot more content really quickly also i want to point out that anybody who has donated to the channel or bought that study guide is getting early releases of these videos, like almost a, a week ahead of time. If you want to be a part of that group, you know what you got to do. Go down to the show notes, and I'll, I'll show you what to go through there. And that study guide is like 50% discounted right now, so be sure to check it out. I'm super excited because I'm starting a new business. I am going to do custom laser cut paper. That's right. You normally just buy printer paper at the store. It doesn't have any holes in it. And then how do you go put it in your three ring binder? Well, I've set up my mill to be able to cut those holes just ever so precisely. I'm, I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be rich, I swear. So now that these holes are cut, you can drop this thing right in the three ring binder. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, look at this. They're, they're just, it's perfection. You can't do any better than this. Uh, but here's the problem I'm having. Uh oh, that's not working. And uh, oh, geez, look at this. What is going on? If we go back to the mill, it's easy to see how this could happen. The mill is so consistent, it's cutting in exactly the same spot every time, no matter how many pieces of paper I do. So it's really about where we place that paper that's going to determine where the holes are. Now if we lay a transparency on here and line it up with those holes, it makes it easier to see the effect. So this paper must have been here when we cut those holes, but if it was here or there or there, that's where the holes are going to go. But the relationship between each hole is extremely consistent and that makes sure that the pegs are always going to go in there. So this relationship between the holes is really as good as the machine can do, whereas where those holes fall on the paper is more about the placement of the paper on the fixture. Clearly, this is a job for gd &T. We've got pegs, we've got holes. All we have to do, just like we did in lesson one, two, three, is figure out what the worst case peg is for size. So the biggest peg and the most out of position that gives us the virtual condition that we then need to stay outside of with our holes. So then worst case of the holes, smallest hole, most out of position needs to always clear the worst case of the peg. This is a classic pegs and holes problem that we totally know how to do. And say, if you want to get into the nitty gritty calculations on pegs and holes, go to the study guide. It covers all that nitty gritty stuff. And let's check out the call out, something you guys are familiar with. We've got our, basically our dart, and this is our bullseye. Of course, when you have the actual GDT call out, there's going to be a number here, but I like a nice graphic representation of a bullseye that I'm trying to hit with my dart and the center of that dart, whatever the feature is, in this case the hole, the center of it just needs to land somewhere in that bullseye. And of course for these to work that bullseye is pretty small, but there it is. And okay, if we hit all of those, the pegs are always going to fit in the holes, no problem. But like I just showed you, There's another way for these things to fail. If we make these holes, this whole pattern of holes, 
too far this way or can it at an angle or something. Yeah, they'll still go on the pegs, but look at this. This is garbage. I mean, this is nobody's going to buy this from me. With this thing hanging, I mean, th this guy hangs clear outside the notebook. You imagine that this this paper clear out here. Nobody's going to want to walk around with their papers hanging way out of their binder. So how do we control this? This this isn't controlled with this callout. And I'm sure you're thinking, okay, just add some datums to this callout and that'll line everything up. But we already know we don't need datums to make pegs fit in holes, right? I mean, go back to that datum video that I did with the, with the hunk of tree and I'm able to call out without any datums. These two pegs are just lined up with each other. I basically have a 2x, in this case a 3x. 2x, get those holes lined up, and even though there are no datums to line up with, I know it slides inside of those holes. So I don't need datums here to make sure those pegs drop in, and this, this call out works for that piece of paper if I have 3x position on those holes. So if we wanted to create a separate call out, just to make sure this paper doesn't drift too far one way or the other when it's attached in the pegs, what might that look like? So these bullseyes are quite a bit bigger because this paper can move quite a bit and still stay inside the binder. So the callout for this size has a bullseye, it's just that bigger size, still a position callout. We're calling it out at max because that's what you do when you're trying to fit pegs in holes. And we went ahead and threw some datums on there. So we've got our primary datum, that's just kind of the flat surface. Uh, B being our secondary, C being our tertiary, that top edge. And of course, whenever you have datums, you've got basic dimensions, identifying true position of these holes back to those edges, okay? In fact, what we really ought to be looking at here is that guy. All right, so we have this requirement that the pegs fit in the holes, and we have our bullseye that we've identified. We, we did all the peg and hole calculations to figure out what the bullseye needed to be so that when we punch the hole, if the center is in that bullseye, the pegs are going to go in the holes. Like we said, there's no need for any datums here. We just have basic dimensions between the holes to make sure that they're the right distance apart and everything works out for this side. Now on this side, separately, we've identified basically how far this piece of paper can go and still be inside the binder. We shift it this way as far as that way can go, and we've come up with an appropriate bullseye size for that so that we keep from having, keep from making scrap in that manner. So this side is covered and this side is covered but how do we bring these two things together we ought to be able to put all this in one call out for the sheet of paper and here's how we're going to do that this is a composite position call out and the most important thing to remember neither of these call outs have changed this bullseye is still the same bullseye that was on that side. So anytime you see a composite, you should be able to look at this lower segment and think, okay, pegs and holes, do all those numbers for what the diameter of the bullseye is, and everything should check out. Now with this pattern up here of how we locate this pattern of holes, those datums are exactly the same as well and the calculations for that size of that bullseye shouldn't be any different either. Now what this means is we can come in now with that pattern of holes that we were punching in that ensures that the pegs will always fit. And we can do anything we want with it as long as it fits inside of those larger zones. We can, we can move it up down, left, right, we can even twist the whole thing. And if we follow both of those bullseyes, basically the, the center of this bullseye has to be inside of 
of each of those holes. But if we follow that, the product that we make will always fit. The pegs will always go in the holes. We got that covered. And the paper will always stay inside of the binder. We've got that covered. Okay. Now, some of you may say, eh, wait a minute. I remember you made this, this piece of scrap that has the holes kicked off at this angle and you're still allowing that with this call out. How do I, how do I prevent that and keep it lined up? That's where datums come in on this lower segment. That is one rule I'll say for the composite position tolerance that the datums in the lower segment only apply to rotation. So we want to line this up to something. Let's add A and B down here. Yeah, come on. And that means now that, you know, if, if this had any thickness to it, if it wasn't just a piece of paper, A would keep us lined up, you know, rotating away from that surface. And then B forces us to be aligned. So now that we have that B in the lower segment, we can still move anywhere we want to in these holes, but it has to be oriented, rotated, as they say in the standard, to B. So come up, down, left, right, and that would probably be a more acceptable callout for what I'm trying to do. Another thing about composite callout that frequently confuses people is this whole restriction on datums that in the lower segment, it has to follow what the uh, datums are in the upper segment and the order that they're in. I was like, okay, why is that? Well, there's, there's a pretty good explanation for it. Let's say I was trying to follow this, but then I just, instead of putting A and B down here, I went A and D or A and E. I just started picking some other random edge or feature that I'm going to use as a datum. Well, what would that look like? If I'm forcing myself to suddenly align with D to keep the holes from being crooked, now I'm going to be coming over like this and go, okay, I can't be crooked, so I'm going to line up with D. And now I come in and I'm trying to line up with my larger bullseyes in the upper segment. And they're competing with each other because I went and chose a different datum to align to to control that rotation. But if we stay with the same set of datums in the same order, you don't have to use them all, but just as you're adding them, it's the same ones in the same order, then the alignment makes sense. The, the callouts are working together rather than competing with each other. And this is how it is with real three-dimensional parts. Yeah, you're never going to get them where the faces are that far out of parallelism, but this on a microscopic level, when you're trying to hit stuff to a thousandth of an inch or hundred of a, hundreds of a millimeter, this stuff really matters. And that's why that rule is there. So at the beginning, when we came out with this first call out here and we said, okay, we're going to try to hit these, these bullseyes for these punch in the holes. And I had this laid out and I said, well, see, I don't need any datums. I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, why don't we just go ahead and add some datums to this? And that's going to fix our problem. We won't be making any, any scrap parts uh, like this, this way with crooked holes and, and out of position. And you're absolutely right. But that is the easy way out. Okay. The whole point of GD&T is to give the manufacturer as much tolerance as you possibly can and have still have functional parts. And if I'm going to just go ahead and restrict not just the whole position, the, the pegs, if I'm going to restrict the pattern to the same requirements that the hole has, when it could be this big, that's going to end up being a more expensive part. It's the job of the design engineer uh, as they're coming up with the design requirements to figure this stuff out and accurately represent it on the print. Now, and if you're still struggling with this concept, it might help to picture like a dotted line around these three larger targets because that is the pattern. Even though each individual hole will be inspected to see if it falls within these larger targets, it really is a pattern that you're trying to position with those larger targets. So there you have it. 
composite position tolerance. Hopefully that was helpful to some of you guys. Remember, like, subscribe, and that way I'll see you in the next video.